Thank you for that great introduction, Dean DiLorenzo. Members of the faculty and administration of the NYU School of Continuing and Professional Studies, honored guests, and especially to the students earning their graduate degrees and their families, this is a day to savor your accomplishment and at least for a moment or two to think about the future. You've done the difficult task of earning a graduate degree because you thought you needed to know more to further your career and to have an impact in the place where you live. As a teacher of graduate students in the tumultuous, pressure-packed, and now terrifying world of journalism, I salute your commitment and tell you that I agree you have done the right thing because people like you can make a difference. I've spent the last three years, in particular, trying to figure out how New York became such a rich and prosperous place. Of course, the New York economy we live in, the one you are about to enter or to move up in, is the product of broad forces, the triumph of Wall Street among four booms and four busts, the rise of tourism to replace manufacturing, and the three emerging industries which today are creating good middle-class jobs in this city, higher education, movie and TV production, and tech. I initially began to begin, the, I initially intended to begin my book in 1969, which I knew represented both the city's all-time peak in jobs and the start of the city's Great Recession, which cost New York 620,000 jobs, lasted seven years, and saw the population decline by almost one million, not to mention the fiscal crisis that sent the city almost into bankruptcy. But it turned out I needed to go back to 1965 because of the terrible misjudgments that Mayor John Lindsay made in his first term. Misjudgments that made that recession so much deeper. Misjudgments which have given us legacies which continue to constrain New York today. It came, became clear to me that people mattered. I also came to realize that there were four or five people who I think changed the city for the better. There was Ed Koch, who changed the attitude at City Hall toward business and the economy. Before Koch, mayors saw the economy and business as a resource to be taxed or regulated and used for other ends. When Koch walked into City Hall with New York at its nadir, the end of that great recession, he said, you know, I can't improve this city unless I get the economy doing. And business, and in his mind, development, was always at the top of his agenda, where it has remained since. And then there was Bill Bratton, Rudy Giuliani's first police chief. When, he came, when Rudy was elected in 1994, New York was in the midst of a terrible crime wave. In 1990, there were more than 2,000 murders in this city. Rudy was elected in part to get the crime rate down, and he chose Bratton to do that. Bratton bought, brought many innovations to New York, but his most important one is that he changed policing forever. He convinced the cops their job was not to make arrests, but to prevent crime. And New York is such a safe city today because of Bill Bratton. Then there was Dan Doktoroff, who tackled the myth of manufacturing. Even after his dream of bringing the Olympics to New York died, when he decided to continue as deputy mayor and has led a rezoning of the city which will allow New York to grow and prosper if we do the right things. Most appropriate to discuss today is Bill Marriott. In my view, the only business person from outside New York who ever bet his entire company on the city. Tourists have always came to New York. Their numbers in the 70s and the early 80s were relatively modest, 16 million or so. Many visited the crossroads of the world in Times Square, which was an urban adventure. Carl Weisbrod, one of your professors who's out there today, spent much of his early career trying to clean up Times Square. And he told me that in the early 80s, the police used to put barricades on 8th Avenue to keep the theater goers and the prostitutes on opposite sides of the street. <laughs> the area's two subway stations were the highest in crime in the entire city. The majority of people who went through Times Square were men 
Women stayed away from the seediness. City government knew that it would take something special to clean up Times Square, and so in the 1970s, they announced plans for a 2,000-room hotel to be built by the famed architect John Boardman, who was known for his dazzling atriums. The area was rezoned, but nothing happened for more than a decade amid the city's economic and fiscal problems. Then Bill Marriott decided to build that hotel. He had joined the company his father had founded in 1956 when it was known for its hot shops restaurants and spearheaded its move into hotels. He had a very strict Mormon upbringing. His father made sure to tell him he was doing a good job once a year, and I mean only once a year. He came to New York periodically because Marriott owned the Essex Hotel, and one day someone told him that the old and outmoded Taft Hotel in Times Square boasted an occupancy rate of 90%. He was intrigued. Hotels do not average 90% occupancy. His father wanted no part of Times Square. Others fought it as well. Many people in the theater community were up in arms about the Marriott Marquis because it would require the raising of three outmoded theaters, even though it would be replaced with a, a modern theater. Architecture critics couldn't stand it. They said it turned its back on the city. You know, they were right in that. It did turn its back on the city. I don't know if you've ever been there, but the lobby's on the eighth floor. Why is it on the eighth floor? because they couldn't trust a lobby on the first floor because they were afraid the drug dealers and the prostitutes would be able to take it over. As the Marriott Hotel went up, the stakes were raised each year as construction costs soared. It, reached, it eventually cost about $400 million, double the original estimate. Marriott couldn't find any partners to share the burden. It owned 89% of the of the hotel and its balance sheet sank under the weight of the investment. I bet the ranch on that hotel, Marriott recalls. He did. He's the only not New Yorker in my view to actually bet his company on the city, but more precisely on that New Yorkers would find a way to somehow clean up Times Square. The hotel opened in October 1985 with 1,876 rooms, and it planned to charge more than $200 a night, an eyebrow-raising price in those days. It increased the number of hotel rooms in the city to just more than 46,000. The hotel struggled at first. Travelers weren't ready to stay that far west in the beginning, but gradually Times Square got a little better, the Marriott Marquis made its mark, and a few years later it did top 90% occupancy, a level it has reached every year since. It produces more revenue than any other hotel in the Marriott chain and more profit. The Marriott Marquis was the first crucial development Crucial event in the development of New York, says Don, John Tisch, a name all of you know well, CEO of the Lowe's Hotel chain and a longtime champion of the industry. It sent a message that it was right to make a big investment in New York. The year the Marriott Marquis opened, the city attracted about 20 million tourists. 25 years later, last year, we attracted more than 50 million. And the mayor says we're headed to 60 million, we'll have to see. A couple years later, the city's tourism industry estimated that it was responsible for about 143,000 jobs. Today, that number is more like 310,000 jobs. The modern tourism industry in New York, which has done so much for this city, is in large measure due to the fact that Bill Marriott saw what New Yorkers couldn't and was willing to risk everything in Times Square. It is possible to make a difference. I hope that some of you do so in the way Bill Marriott did. Thank you very much.